My name is George Samuel, and I want to welcome all of you to the Read View Bible Chapel weekly broadcast for this Sunday, August the 16th of 2020. With all the restrictions and physical distancing in place, I still hope you're all having a great summer. Today's message is brought to you by Keith Blair, so we'll hear from him in a moment. We'll continue to have our meeting every Tuesday via Zoom. This Tuesday, we have Keith Blair, who is sharing to us from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18 to 28. Next Sunday, we have George Ferrier, who will be starting a two-week series of messages. We we'll continue to have our Lord's Supper every Sunday morning. We have it both via Zoom, as well as in person, with a limit of 55 people. All the details of these meetings are found in your email. So if you have not already subscribed to our mailing list, please do so that you do not miss out on any of the messages. We have another picnic planned this afternoon, so please feel free to join a small group of socially distanced people at the Vincent Macy Park this afternoon. Do bring your own picnic. The details are in your email from RBC Messenger. Tim Knuth has been doing some messages for the kids. The child in me has been enjoying that a lot. So here he is now. Good morning, boys and girls, and welcome to another story of Elijah. Today, Elijah takes us to Mount Carmel, where there's a contest between Elijah's God and Ahab's God. I remember Ahab's God was Baal, and uh, he was the weather God who controlled the rain. And by this time in the story, there has been no rain on the earth for almost three years, and the earth was getting pretty dry. Things were getting pretty desperate for the people. And uh, Elijah knew this as well, and, and God had told Elijah uh, to, to go to Mount Carmel and to set up this contest. Basically, the contest was to prove which God was real. Now, I have a fence up in the sky here, and the fence, uh, I can do that because it's a flannel graph. Uh, we can do a lot of things with that, but... But this fence will illustrate uh, sometimes what's in our mind uh, regarding God. Sometimes we like to sit on the fence about our decisions for God. Now, have you ever sat in the middle of a fence? You don't last too long because it's not too comfortable. 
But if you ever thrown a ball over the fence and had to go get it and you tried to climb over the fence, well, to get up over the fence is difficult. But then, you know, you, you get in the middle and you're kind of, you got to go on one side or the other because it's not too comfortable to stay there. And, and that's like our minds and decisions, right? It's, it's uncomfortable to be indecisive or not make a decision about something. Have you ever had to make a decision between the red candy or the blue candy or which favored animal to take to the cottage that weekend? Elijah takes the people of Israel to a place where they have to make a decision for God. They could not sit on the fence. They had to sit on one side or another. And uh, it wasn't until then that they make a decision for God that the blessings would follow. That was rain in this case. The rain would fill the earth again once they made a decision about God and decided to follow him. But first, God was going to show himself that he was the one true God. Now, Elijah, he challenges Ahab. He says, come to Mount Carmel, and this is what I want you to do. We're going to have a contest here. We're going to set up two altars. We're going to sacrifice on the altar, and then we're going to pray to our God, the God who rains fire from heaven and consumes the sacrifice will prove himself as the God of gods, as the only God. Do we all agree with this? Ahab said, certainly we do. So Ahab came to Mount Carmel for this showdown. And he came with 400 prophets, 450 prophets of Baal, and four other prophets of another goddess, another god. And they all came with the children of Israel as well. They all agreed that this was the best way to determine uh, wh whose God was real. So the prophets came to witness this. And the children of Israel came too. King Ahab made an altar, which was stones piled up and sticks on the top they would usually light this they would put the sacrifice over top and they would light the sticks and that would go up to their god but instead fire would come down and light it from heaven if if their god was the real god and so they they continued from morning till noon uh, chanting out to god their god baal trying to pray to him, and uh, and Elijah said, well, what's going on? I mean, there's been no answer. It's been from morning to, to noon, and there's been no answer from your God. Where is he? Maybe you should cry a little louder. Maybe you should lift up your voice and and uh, and start yelling or something like that. And, and they, they did do that. And also Elijah was saying, well, maybe he's on a holiday. Maybe he's too busy to answer you. Um... You know, maybe he's meditating. Maybe he's somewhere else thinking about something else. He doesn't want to listen to you right now. And uh, they were continuing from, from noon to evening, and, and there was still no answer. Even though they were cutting themselves, and, and they were making all kinds of effort to uh, ask uh, Baal to rain fire down from heaven and prove that he was real and that he was the God of God's. Well, this happened all day. And there was, the Bible said there was no answer. There was no voice. And it says no one paid attention. No one paid attention. And uh, despite all the askings and the prayers that were going up to Baal and the different actions that they were doing all day long, there was just no answer. There was no response. And so then it was Elijah's turn. Elijah came and he made the same altar. He took 12 stones and made the same altar. He took wood, same thing. And the only thing that he did differently was that he, he put water on the altar. Uh, he took a sacrifice, a, a bowl, and he put it on the altar. 
But uh, before he called for his God to rain fire down from heaven, he wanted to make it absolutely sure that this fire would start from nowhere else, but from God himself, from heaven down. And so he asked people to come and, and to pour water all over the altar. And uh, they came with four water pots at a time. And he says, well, I want you to do it another time. I wanted to do it a third time. So four times three is 12, 12 water pots uh, on the altar, so much that the water at the base started filling up and surrounding the altar. So when you're at the campfire, you would usually use water to put the fire out, right? And, uh, but Elijah wanted to set up the scene such that there would be no question that uh, the fire would have to come from heaven itself. And so I'm going to read you the verse. Uh, remember that King Ahab uh, was all day with his prophets uh, asking Baal to answer. Uh, I'm going to read a prayer now that took about 20 seconds to say. And uh, Elijah says this, Hear me, O Lord, Hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now that took about 20 seconds to say, and that's all it took for Elijah. was uh, Because what happened was at that point, God had sent fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice. Not only that, consume the stones and the dust. Now, fire that, that eats up stones and then licks up all the water uh, is an amazing uh, thing in itself. But there was no question about who, whose God was the real God. And it says this, now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And so the response of the people to the God of Elijah was to fall on their faces and say that, you know what, Elijah's God, he is the one true God. And so God proves himself to be real. Now, up to this point, there had been no rain, um, but God proves himself to be real and the challenge goes out to the people of Israel. Okay, who are you going to follow now? There's no sitting on the fence. Uh, you sit on one side <clears throat> or the other. And soon after this, after they made a decision to, to follow God, uh, the blessing of water came, the blessing of rain came. And really, that's the biggest question before blessing is, is that uh, God wants to be trusted for, for being real and to take him seriously. And so... There's no sitting on the fence. We have to sit on one side or the other, like we said before. And Elijah had asked the people of Israel, how long are you going to go between the two? You got to pick one or the other. You pick the Lord Jesus, or you you follow something else, and that's that's what represents the prophet or Baal, the idol. But you either follow the Lord Jesus or something else, and the Lord Jesus wants us to make a decision for Him, and uh, He wants us to receive Him into our hearts. I pray that you can do that today and uh, that you would find the blessing and protection that's found in the Lord Jesus from our sin. And he gives us a home in heaven and peace that's beyond understanding. And uh, so I hope you can do that today, boys and girls, uh, and learn from Elijah's story here today. It was a real story, a true story. And I pray that you get something from it. And so tune in next week for another story of Elijah. Thank you, Tim. I'd now like to introduce our speaker for today. Our speaker this morning is Keith Blair. We all know Keith. He spoke to us a few weeks ago. But for those of you who did not connect to our earlier broadcast, I'll introduce him to you. 
Keith was born and raised in Calgary, but moved to Toronto in his youth, where he met his wife, Sharon. They have lived in the Ottawa area for the past 34 years. They have two daughters, Dawn and Amy. Keith and Sharon has been in fellowship at Rita View for about 20 years. During the week, Keith works in the new construction business for Cardell Homes. Keith speaks regularly at Rita View, and we always appreciate what he brings to us from the Word of God. Before I hand it over to Keith, I'm going to open in a word of prayer. Dear God, we want to thank you, Lord, for the memories of the cross this morning and the reminder about your Son, our Redeemer, and His unconditional love for us. We're going through a time of pandemic, political issues, and chaos as we look around. But we want to thank you, Lord, for your word, which says, even if the world passes away, your words will never pass away. So as we listen to your word this morning, I pray that you will ready our hearts and our minds, that we not only understand, but we live our life that brings you glory. We ask these things in the precious and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Commentators have suggested that this psalm could be divided into two sections. The first section in verses 1 to 4 presents to us a beautiful metaphor of the Lord as the good shepherd, a shepherd who cares diligently with great love for his sheep, providing all that they need. The second section from verses 5 and 6 presents a metaphor of the Lord as a host of a great banquet, a generous host providing lavishly for those who come to the banquet. Uh, I've enjoyed, I've appreciated uh, this understanding of the psalm and I would like to think a little bit more about the first section in particular. Today, in fact, we're going to look primarily at one line. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let's consider this shepherd metaphor in these first four verses. We can appreciate how the Lord is depicted as a shepherd and how that applies to sheep in the first line, and the second line, and the third line. But things become a little bit more complex when we get to the fourth line and the fifth line. Let me show you what I mean. In the first line of the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We can appreciate how sheep might have needs and that the Lord as the shepherd of the sheep would care for the needs of the sheep. And so the metaphor works there as it applies to sheep and we can understand how that would impact our lives. He goes on to the next line and says that he, he makes us to lie down in green pastures and he leads us beside the still waters. These are things that sheep would appreciate and that would be beneficial for them. And similarly, they are beneficial for us as human beings. The Lord takes us to these green meadows and these still waters. We thought a bit about that in our last message together. When we come to the next line, it becomes a little bit more challenging. The metaphor applies a little bit better with regard to the human side of the equation than the shepherd and the sheep. He restores my soul. Sheep might have reasons for anxiety and they can certainly become stressed. There's no question about it, but sheep do not have souls the way that humans do. Uh, the metaphor works beautifully when we apply it to ourselves, uh, understanding the Lord does restore our souls in, in a way that he, he could never do for sheep, the shepherd could never do for the sheep. And as we continue on, 
this uh, uh, develops even more to the impact of the human side of this equation when we come to the line that we want to think about today. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sheep wouldn't understand righteousness or wickedness. They, they don't have uh, an understanding of right and wrong, of evil and good, uh, they, the way that humans do. And so when we develop deeper and deeper into this, this uh, beautiful psalm, and as we see the metaphor unfold, we see how it uh, is much richer for us as sheep of the Good Shepherd, human beings, and how God seeks to direct us. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let's look at this little expression in three sections, if you would. First of all, he leads me. We'll think about that for a few minutes. Then the paths of righteousness. I want to think about what that means. What are the paths of righteousness? And then we'll finish with a few thoughts about his name's sake and what that means to us. I want to show you two images now. I'll show you the first on the screen. An image that I'm attracted to, especially because of the childhood memories that it brings back to me when I was young. My father had two brothers, my two of my uncles who lived on farms in eastern Alberta, and we would go out to visit them. My dad loved to take us out uh, at the time of year when my brothers would be bringing cattle in from the fields. They gathered them from around the vast prairie where they were uh, where they were grazing, and he would bring them in to, to uh, be processed, to be evaluated and checked. Each animal was brought into the, uh, they were all brought into the corral, and then each animal was checked and given a, an inoculation and uh, pro checked over to ensure all was well before they were taken back out to the fields. These cattle drives have a fun memory to me. Uh, if you look at this uh, picture carefully, you can see a couple of cowboys at the back. And so when I was out in the farm, I remember them being out on horseback, even rounding up cattle, like you see in this picture. Compare that to this photo, which uh, shows a different kind of animal husbandry. Here we have uh, sheep. I'm going to ask you to evaluate the differences between these two photos. Of course, you might say, well, one is cattle and one is sheep. Obviously, that's a significant difference. But I'm looking for more than that. Look at the first photo again. And notice the location of these cowboys. There you see them in the back, uh, in the back left corner. Uh, closer here. Now, where are they positioned? The back of the herd driving them forward. Now look again at the picture of the shepherd and see the difference here as the shepherd leads the flock as opposed to the cowboys who are driving the herds. And we see a stark difference between driving the cattle and leading the sheep. A shepherd leads, and in scripture, the depiction is always of the shepherd leading the sheep, not driving the sheep on. This reminds us that in the account of Scripture, God is seen as leading his people. He does not force his people. When we were out in the fields driving the cattle to get them into the corral, I can tell you what we were causing them to do was to do something that they wouldn't otherwise have done, go somewhere where they would not have chosen to go. We forced them there really against their will. They didn't want to go there, but we pushed them and cause them to go, go there by our actions. Not so the shepherd, who is seen in the image leading the sheep. And so the Lord leads and the Lord directs. Now there's a problem with, with that. Fundamental problem is that sometimes the sheep don't want to follow the shepherd. Sometimes the sheep go astray. And we see this often depicted in Scripture as well. The picture in Scripture often depicts sheep that have left the flock and have gotten themselves into trouble and have taken a wrong path and the shepherd having to go and find the sheep and return the sheep to the care of the flock and under the care of the, the shepherd of the sheep. Uh, we are reminded of this in 
the New Testament, for example, 1 Peter chapter 2, where Peter reminds us that we were all like sheep going astray, but we have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And so uh, Peter recognizes that we, like sheep, sometimes get off track, sometimes go astray. And he rejoices when we've been brought back to be returned to the shepherd outside of Christ. The, the scriptures depict us as lost sheep, vulnerable to prey, predation by enemies and wild beasts and uh, dangers of all kinds. But we have returned to the shepherd when we came to know Christ as our Lord and Savior. And now we are in the fold, in the sheepfold of the, the shepherd of the sheep. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was often depicted in the same similar way as uh, the sheep of, of the good shepherd who is the Lord. And so the Lord leads, and the Lord leads his sheep in, in a way that provides instruction and direction and guidance and assurance and encouragement. So the, the Lord leads rather than drives those who are his. Uh, the children of Israel were led through the wilderness. They weren't driven through the wilderness. They were led through the wilderness. They were led, we read, in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. And when the Lord would have them move on, that pillar would rise and move forward and the people would follow. And so whether corporately or individually, the Lord in the pages of Scripture is depicted as one who leads the flock. Those who are the Lord's have responsibility to follow the shepherd. You and I, if we are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, need to seek to follow the shepherd. John, when he writes his gospel, speaks about this in John chapter 10, where he says this, the Lord, he records the words of the Lord, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know the voice of the shepherd. We need to know more about following the shepherd. We often like to think about leading. We like to encourage people to be leaders. We have lots of seminars, how to be a good leader, things that will develop leadership. And it's great to have leaders. We thank the Lord for them. And it's good to encourage our leaders and to develop leadership. But sometimes I think we need to give more attention to following, learning what it means to be a good follower, because we have a great shepherd, one who looks out for our interests, who cares for us, and we need to follow him, and we need to be good followers of the shepherd. The Lord knows what's best for his sheep, and like the Israelites, we too often tend to wander. God allows us to do so. We have choice. He leads, and we need to choose to follow him. I want to think for a minute about the next expression, in the paths of righteousness. What are the paths of righteousness? What would this mean to sheep? He leads in the paths of righteousness. I note that some translations have uh, have recorded this as that he leads in the right paths, the right paths, the paths that uh, lead quickest to the destination that's determined or that are the, the best or safest, the right ones as opposed to the wrong ones. I'm not sure that that's adequate, really. The word here is righteousness, and it refers to the opposite of wickedness or evil, and God leads us in the paths of righteousness, those paths that uh, that have good and and moral character those paths that are uh, the right choices for us to make the expression that he leads us in the paths of righteousness implies that there are other paths paths of wickedness we might say paths that aren't righteous uh, that implies that there are decisions that are to be made that there are forks in the road. Sometimes in our lives we face decisions like this when we come to a fork in the road. What, where are we to travel? What is the right course for us to follow? How can we know 
whether the one on the, the right is, is correct, a little bit of an uphill climb, a tougher road, a little bit more difficult perhaps, or, or should we be taking the one more commonly traveled on the left, a little easier slope down the hillside? How are we to know what is the right path for us to take? The Lord gives us some insight into making decisions about the right path. The Lord leads us so that we can choose the right path. And I've come to understand this expression, perhaps a little more in the lines of what it means to understand God's will than as a promise that uh, he will always see that we are on the right path. Rather, he leads us. It is our decision to follow him. And when we come to decisions, forks in the road where we must choose a course of action, where we must choose a path to take, he gives us insight into understanding which one would be the right path. And the insight that we might gain is which one is the path of righteousness? Which one is virtuous? Which one is morally right? Which one is fair? Which one is just? Which one is good? Which one is ethical? Where is honesty? Where is truth? Where is virtue? He gives us the ability as his sheep to discern these things, to understand his character and to choose paths that are in line with his character. And so he leads us in paths of righteousness. David wrote this psalm, of course, and his testimony here is that God leads him in paths of righteousness. Now it's interesting because as we reflect on David's life a little bit, we can appreciate that David made a number of good choices. He was a man after God's own heart. God commands him a number of times in the pages of scripture. But we know as well that there were times when David made poor choices, where David sinned, where David was committed, committing grievous evil against people in his nation and more, more importantly against the Lord. And yet David testifies to us in this psalm that he was led in paths of righteousness. I have to understand this to, to mean that there are times when David recognized the leading of the Lord and followed the Lord in paths of righteousness and there were other times when he didn't pay attention to the direction and the leadership of the Lord and went off on his own and got sidetracked about an evil. And so it is with you and I. Like any sheep, like any of us, David sometimes made poor decisions and followed sinful paths rather than the paths of righteousness. God would have us to follow him, the great shepherd, that we would choose paths of righteousness to follow. What examples can we see of God's shepherding guidance into paths of righteousness. What examples do we see in David's life, for example? David testifies here, he leads me in paths of righteousness. Let's think about three of those. Some examples in David's life of how he was led in paths of righteousness. Let's think first about perhaps the favorite Bible story of many children around the world story of David and Goliath. Here we find David as a young man and he is led by God, I'm going to suggest, down a path of righteousness when he encountered one standing up in defiance against God. 1 Samuel 17 is where we find a record of this incident. David is given an assignment by his father David has three brothers who are fighting in Saul's army and uh, they are facing off against the Philistines. And each day, unknown to David, each day a man by the name of Goliath, a giant, a large man, comes out in front of the armies of Israel and berates them, ridicules them, challenges them to come up and fight against him. Choose a man to come and fight against me. He defies the army and he defies the God of Israel, ridicules them and ridicules their God. David is told by his father, take these cheeses and this bread and some wheat and go out and visit your brothers, take this food to them out in the army, for support them. We need to support the army as it faces the Philistines. So David goes off on his way. 
he would have been very well to fulfill his task. Uh, all would have thought uh, that was all that was expected of him. Go deliver the Jesus, go deliver the bread, say hi to your brothers, and then head back and look after the sheep. Had he done that, everyone would have thought he was doing all that was expected of him. But we read that as David approached the scene of the battle, in verse 20 of chapter 17, it says he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for the battle. He came to the camp. It's interesting this word here translated camp is the same word that is in our passage in Psalm 23. They're translated path. There was a place where the army pitched their tent and there was the battle scene in the valley where on one side of the stream was the armies of the Philistines and the other the armies of the nation of Israel. And they came out and confronted each other each day, not yet engaging in battle. And as the army was on its way from the tents down the path to the scene where the confrontation takes place, David arrives on the scene. He comes upon the path as they're on their way down to the front lines, as it were. He came to the path and there the Lord led him into a different path than his original assignment. He had come to deliver bread and to assist his brothers, but now his path is changed as he listens and hears the defiant words of this Philistine. David takes note. Verse 26, David says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? It's interesting to note that David's own brothers opposed him. They were skeptical of the reason that he was there. They gave him what we would call a hassle over this. Eliab, his oldest brother, when he heard David speak, his anger was aroused and he said, why have you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart. You have come down to see the battle. He suspected David's intentions were not good. But David was recognizing that God's name was, was being mocked that the God of the armies of Israel was being defied. And so he took a course of action that was different than the original sign that he had been given. He chose a path of righteousness. He stood up to the giants, to the giant, and defeated him. He recognized that God was behind him, that God was with the nation of Israel. David said, the Lord has delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. His confidence was in God, and he moved forward when he heard that God's name was being defiled. The path of righteousness. David, as he approached this Philistine giant, says this, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. David chose a path of righteousness when he heard the name of his God being defiled. The second incident that I want you to think about is a few chapters later, 1 Samuel chapter 24. Not this time David and Goliath, but David and Saul. There we see an example of the path of righteousness, where he exhibits grace in the face of injustice. Saul resented David. He resented his conquest in battle. He resented the uh, respect and uh, recognition that David was receiving from the people and from the army and from all those around. 
he saw him as a threat. And though David had done no wrong, Saul victimized him. He, he, he sought to do him harm. He went out, in fact, seeking his life. And as we find David in chapter 24, in fact, again in chapter 26, he is running from Saul. He is fleeing from Saul for fear of his life. Saul is out to kill him. David might have cause to wonder why God would bring this upon him in this way. Why this injustice was being served. Sometimes in our lives, as in David's, we see injustice sometimes in the world around us, sometimes as it affects our own lives. People have treated us unfairly. People have done us wrong. How do we respond in those times? How did David respond in this time of injustice? David was not being treated properly and fairly and rightly by Saul, but God was leading David and God led David down a path of righteousness. And so it was as Saul came out to seek David and find him in the wilderness and to take his life from him. He went into the cave to relieve himself. We read the story in Psalm 20, in 1 Samuel 20, 24. David was hiding in the cave and Saul comes into the cave. David was able to creep up close enough to actually cut a corner off of Saul's garment. Those around him, David's companions, as he was hiding in the wilderness, encouraged David to take Saul's life. This is your opportunity. He's right there. Kill him now. But Saul, but David, but David refused to do so. He would not raise his hand against the one whom God had appointed as leader of the people. Saul, Saul sought to take David's life, but David would not raise his hand against Saul. Despite the injustice that Saul was doing him, to him, David chose the path of righteousness. He recognized Saul's authority was established by the Lord, and he would not lift his hand against Saul. He left the resolution of the matter in the hands of the Lord. Verse 15, we read this, Therefore, let the Lord be judge, and judge between you and me, and see and plead my case, and deliver me out of your hand. David was prepared to let the Lord be the judge of the situation and not take matters into his own hands. He chose the path of righteousness. Our shepherd leads in paths of righteousness. We find Another incident in David's life where uh, he is confronted by a man named Nabal. David is still out in the wilderness, still uh, having to scrounge a living, hiding from Saul. Uh, he looks after those who are in the vicinity. He cares for this man Nabal. He looks after Nabal's uh, shepherds and herdsmen and protects them and provides uh, encouragement to them and protection for them. And on one occasion, as David and his men are weak and thirsty and hungry, they come to Nabal and say, can you provide for us a little bit of food, a little bit of refreshment? David has treated this man very well. He's looked after him. He has looked after his flocks. He has done great service for him. But now Nabal responds and says, no, I'm not interested in helping you at all. I wonder if sometimes we have been provoked. David's response in this instance was one of anger. David became angry because of Nabal's reaction. And he was provoked by Nabal, a man who carelessly and without regard turned his back on one who had provided all kinds of assistance and help to him. In our lives, sometimes we face situations like that, don't we? Someone treats us in a way that causes our anger to be aroused. I can relate to this. I can think of instances in my life where my heart has welled up in anger because of someone's response, somebody's the way they have treated me. David's initial response here was one of anger. He looked for retribution. He was, as it were, on the warpath. He determined that he was going to go and do harm to Nabal, physical harm. And he took his soldiers with him and he was on the war, on the, on the war path, on the path to Nabal, when the Lord intervened, when the Lord 
intercepted him along the path and changed his course and set him instead on the path of righteousness. It's interesting to read 1 Samuel 25 and see how he did this. He did it through the counsel and advice of a woman, Nabal's wife, who came and appealed to him, intervened, and encouraged David to reconsider what he was doing. David recognized that the advice that he was getting from this woman was right. That he was in fact going to set about on a course that he, he would later regret. A course that was not righteous. So Abigail appeals to him. In verse 26, the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand. David recognized the wrong course that he was on, and he changed his path. The Lord led him through the voice and the counsel of Abigail to do what was right. He acknowledges this. So it is in our lives when we're confronted with situations where we might be inclined to strike out in anger. God allows us to respond differently to provocations. We are not animals. We are humans and have the ability to choose our responses to provocation. God has given us the mind and the sensibility to step back and to say, I won't respond in that way. God would lead me to a path of righteous conduct and leave vengeance to the Lord. We need to listen to the voices that the shepherd brings across our path as David listened to the voice of this woman who God brought upon his path. Verse 32, we read, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me, and blessed is your advice, and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. Abigail encourages David for good and that he would not come to rash decisions. And so it is that God brings into our lives sometimes people who will give us wise counsel. And we can listen to them and we need to heed that advice. Sometimes God is using these people to set us onto the right path, paths of righteousness. The Lord leads in paths of righteousness so David could testify, as he does in this beautiful psalm. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Let's think for a minute about this last expression, for his name's sake. God does not lead us down these paths for our own glory or for our own recognition. You should not be seeking acknowledgement or praise from men. The Lord instructs this, for example, in Matthew chapter 5. In verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are not doing these things to receive the glory, but to rather pass the glory on to our Father who is in heaven, that God would be glorified in what we do. When we choose paths of righteousness, we are doing so because we are, shep we are sheep of the King. We are sheep of the Great Shepherd. And we want him to be glorified. We want recognition and glory to go to the Lord. In each of David's examples that we've considered, whether with Goliath or with Saul or with Nabal, in each case we see that it was the Lord of hosts. It was the Lord who was given the glory. David says as he approaches, Goliath, I have come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And so it is in our lives as we seek to do good, we do so for his namesake. Israel was repeatedly admonished for bringing disrepute to the name of God. They were his people. And so their sin was a reflection on God's character. They were misrepresenting him to the nations around. In the New Testament, we are given further insight so that we can understand that the disrepute that comes to God's name is is seen also by the angelic hosts. We need to be careful of our conduct because not only are the people of the world looking on, 
but angelic beings as well. We need to be honoring the name of the Lord Jesus Christ through our conduct. God will indeed reward us as we live for him, as we choose the paths of righteousness. The psalm makes that clear at the end in verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God will do good for his people. But our motivation in choosing paths of righteousness is that his name would be glorified, that it is for his sake that we do these things. We are his sheep, and our faithfulness in following him is observed by countless eyes, many of whom we're not even aware of. Let's be faithful in following our shepherd in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Father, we thank you for this wonderful lesson from your word, this beautiful psalm, and for all that it has for us in encouragement. We pray that you would help us to be faithful followers of our shepherd who leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd of the sheep. And as he calls his sheep, may we respond always quickly, obediently, to stick close to the one who is there for our guidance, for our protection, for our encouragement, that he might shower his love upon us. Lord, keep us from going astray, we pray. May we always be looking for the right paths, following your leadership. In these things, we ask for your help in, this, in Jesus' name. Amen. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best heart, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, Thy presence, my light. Be Thou my wisdom, and Thou my true word. I ever with Thee, and Thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, then I Thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with Thee one. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and Thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure Thou art. High King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all.